this week on the Back Table Podcast. Be loud and vocal. Talk to your reps. They're under tremendous pressure with far bigger dollars being directed at them than what the physician groups are able to do. But I think even at that level, Medicare and the government realizes the just sheer ridiculousness of paying 50% more for the exact same thing just because it happens to be in a different site. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Backtable Podcast. It's your source for all things interventional and endovascular. You can find all previous episodes of our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and on backtable.com. Now, a quick word from our sponsor. This discussion is supported by Siemens Health and Years. What's one of the primary reasons outpatient care sites fail? Inadequate front-end planning. If you're planning to provide outpatient care, you need a clear, cohesive strategy a strategy that supports your unique vision for success. Siemens Health and Years is here to empower you in every care setting, every step of the way. Visit Siemens-HealthandYears.us to discover the seven key elements of a comprehensive outpatient site strategy and learn how providers leverage the specific expertise, products, and services from Siemens Health and Years to meet their outpatient care goals. Embracing innovation, enhancing outcomes. Greetings to our esteemed IR community. Today's podcast is proudly sponsored by Varian, a Siemens Health and Ears company. Picture a future where cutting edge interventional technologies are seamlessly integrated with world-class imaging tools that are designed to reshape procedural efficiency, enhance precision, and foster patient-centered care and interventional radiology. Because that's our vision at Varian, and we're working with partners across Siemens Health and Ears to bring it to life. At Varian, we are in hot pursuit of efficiency and superior outcomes. Our evolving portfolio is reshaping ablation and embolization procedures with tools that offer intuitive, unique capabilities. Imagine a world without fear of cancer, where Varian solutions empower you to deliver individualized, high-quality treatments. Solutions like Embazine and Oncazine are a line of precisely calibrated microspheres designed to enable super-selective, targeted embolization. What sets our Embazine and Oncazine microspheres apart? Features that enhance procedural and cost efficiency, like precise calibration and syringes that contain more microspheres per volume, which means fewer syringes per procedure, an innovation that aligns seamlessly with Varian's commitment to efficiency. And Embazine microspheres offer a broad spectrum of 10 sizes, each identified by distinctive colors, facilitating swift and precise visualization of suspension. This streamlines the process and also minimizes the potential for errors. So experience the future of interventional radiology with Varian. Check out our innovative solutions at varian.com slash interventional. Varian, a Siemens Health and Ears company, we pioneer breakthroughs in healthcare for everyone, everywhere, sustainably. Now, back to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Ali Behetti. I'm coming to you from Tacoma, Washington. And my guest today is Dr. Michael Cumming. He is an interventional radiologist and founder of Vascular and Interventional Experts. Michael, thank you so much for being on the show today. Thank you for having me. Our topic today is based around site of service, and we'll get into what that is. But can you help me understand how you first got interested in this topic? Well, site of service impacts how we get paid. And there's an enormous differential between the three primary settings that we deal with in terms of how physicians are paid and what insurance and Medicare pay for those services. Okay, so explain this to me like I'm an idiot, basically. Got it. (laughs) First of all, who determines payment for a certain procedure? Let's just start with the total basics. Right. So CMS sets, you know, the government sets our rates for payment. And this started, so back in about the 2000s, Medicare rolled out this new payment service or payment system for hospital outpatient services. And the idea was to reduce inpatient costs, but... It partly backfired because it created these perverse incentives for hospitals to buy out surgery centers and physician offices to obtain higher reimbursement. I see. Okay. So that was the start of creating these site of service differentials. Can you kind of give me like a little bit of history about what has happened since then? Yeah. So if you look back, what site of service is driven. And so I'll I'll give you an example I was part of a multi-specialty medical group practice in the 2000s, 
that was financially struggling and the hospital system offered to bring us in as part of the hospital and our leadership capitulated and we became employed physicians at a hospital. And that immediately brought in something like 15 million more dollars into our group practice, but we didn't change anything. We had the same employees, the same building, the same facilities, the same equipment, but all of a sudden there was 15 more million dollars on the table. So you can imagine, so all we accomplished there was driving up the cost of care with no changes in the quality. Interesting. Okay. So what are the different sites of service? Well, there's quite a few of them. I think there's maybe more than 10 different services. So I think the, the ones that really impact to us are going to be hospital outpatient department and then ambulatory surgery centers and then uh, physician office. Okay. And inpatient. Yeah. As a separate one. Yeah. Okay. So the, the, the other sites of service, you know, you're going to have things like skilled nursing facilities, freestanding emergency departments, independent testing facilities. So there's there's quite a few different sites of service under CMS. Got it. And so CMS decides what payment is tied to a different site of service. What is the cost differential or what is the payment differential between these different sites? If you could give us maybe some examples. Great. So each procedure, you know, we have CPT codes, right? That's how we bill for what we do. And depending on the CPT code, most of them that we deal with are reimbursable in a hospital outpatient or in a physician office. And so what happens in these situations, like in a physician office, we get a global payment from CMS, whereas in ASC, you get a facility payment and a physician payment, and which is the same as also in a hospital outpatient. So you get a physician payment and then a facility fee. So when we're comparing these, you need to, when you're in an ASC, you need to take the AS, the facility and the, and the physician uh, fee and add them together really to get your global payment. That's a good thing, kind of being able to compare apples to apples across diff- for a given procedure across different sites. Right. So if you want to take a look at like a specific procedure, say a chest port. In a chest port, in a physician office, compared to an ASC, compared to a, a hospital outpatient department, and the cost of doing that. And typically, if you just look across the broad range of CPT codes that we use, something that we do in the physician office is usually half the cost of it being done in a hospital outpatient department. And then there's a lot of differences between ASC and physician offices as Medicare has been playing with the reimbursement rates between these. And that gets into our discussions that we have so often is, should I open an ASC? Should I open an OBL? What is Medicare going to do with reimbursement in these two situations, which is, you know, driving more OBLs to at least be a hybrid model where they can do ASC and physician office based procedures? Right, right. Yeah. So is there data supporting better procedural outcomes in the outpatient settings that we can use to show that, you know, this is not a great way to bill people? Yeah, I think from the procedures we do, there's a lot of different inputs that go into the determining where a procedure should be done and the right facility to do it in. And so if you take patients that are suitable for an outpatient procedure where you do not need hospital facility, there's no question we can do the same procedures. And there are some quality data metrics, you know, pulled from registries like from the OEIS and other registries showing that quality is, in fact, very good across these. And so quality is mostly driven from my perspective, from the quality of the operator doing the procedure and not so much the site the procedure is being done in. Right. Makes sense. What are kind of the important players that are involved that keep this payment structure the way that it is? Right. So, you know, the big push or the, the lobbyist side of it is there's a group of different lobbyists, but the largest will be one of the American Hospital Association. And the American Hospital Association is very against current legislation trying to address this side of service differential and the perverse incentives that come with it. And so they like the site of service differentials because they get paid a lot more for doing exactly the same thing. Sure. So tell me a little bit about the AHA's position on the idea of site-neutral payment cuts? 
Well, the EHA is obviously not in favor of uh, eliminating the differentials in site of service payments. And they have a lot of hard to justify points behind it. And they do make some valid arguments in terms of the importance of the hospital system and that they need to get appropriate payment and funding so that we can keep hospitals open and keep them viable and keep their value in the, in the communities that they are in. And so when we look at their arguments, they argue, yes, everything we do costs more and, and definitely things we do in the hospital cost more. There, there's no question yeah. about that. However, that argument really, what it does is it doesn't allow for delivering efficient care. So the argument I think should be, yes, we need to fund hospitals appropriately, but we don't need to pay hospitals more to do things that can be done in a lower cost environment. It creates a lot of artificial expense. Sure. Okay. That makes sense. Are there advocates on the other side of this? I mean, that are advocating for site neutral payments? Well, I think the advocacy on our side, it's complicated because we have a lot of stakeholders in our various organizations. And so organizations like the AMA has really is essentially neutral on site of service differential removal. So they've kind of stayed out of this debate over site of service and neutralizing the payments. Okay, interesting. Um, and then I, I assume, you know, other advocacy groups would include kind of OEIS. Do each of the individual endovascular societies have their own skin in the game here, or are they kind of staying out of it too? Yeah, for our professional organization, SIR, I really don't know if they have an opinion on this. And the reason is, is the stakeholders, we all have different opinions on it. I live in the physician office, ASC world, and so I would like to see site of service neutral payments. Whereas those that are primarily in a hospital-based practice don't want to see those changes happen. So even physicians don't really all align on this issue. Can you give me kind of a, some idea as to how much a different procedure would cost at each of the settings? Maybe like where you live for, I know it's different everywhere. I know that there's a lot of local factors that are in play, but just for the audience to kind of understand what orders of magnitude we're talking about for like something simple like a chest port, for example. And as all of this information publicly available, I guess that'd be the other question. Yeah, absolutely. So all the payment information is publicly available. It's actually very easy to go to CMS website and look up specific CPT codes to see what proceed or how CPT codes are reimbursed. Across our broad range of CPT codes that, that we do, the savings from a physician office to a hospital really varies. It can be 25% cheaper in the office, 75% cheaper in the office. So like to give you an example, I happen to have some nephrology examples here. If you want to do that, if you were to put a nephrostomy tube in, in your OBL, you would get about $900 for doing that procedure. That same procedure in the hospital is about $2,000. So that's a really significant increase in, in cost. And some of them are even more expensive. So like to exchange a nephrostomy ca uh, catheter in your office, you get $527 and in a hospital, it's about $1,900. So really significant cost differences. And I think like a nephrostomy to exchange is a really good example. They do not need to be done in a hospital. There, it's really hard to make an argument you need to do a NEF2 change in a hospital situation. Definitely. So I'm sure payers are seeing all this data, right? And seeing the different cost savings, how are they directing patients to use more outpatient facilities or are they even directing patients to use more outpatient facilities? Yeah, there's a lot going on. This is going to be very local in terms of what commercial payers are doing. They would love to see the site of service differentials go away. And in our market, we've not seen a lot of steering of patients to outpatient facilities. I think other markets have seen a lot of this drive where the insurer is directing the patient here in just our local market. There's very little steerage happening. Got it. Could you give me some data about outcomes uh, of doing cases in the outpatient setting versus in the hospital setting? Certainly. So OEIS has published a couple of papers using registry data, looking at outcomes in an office based practice, showing that the outcomes are, in fact, excellent. And in 2021, there was a study in JAMA where they looked at a large number of patients, like over 100,000 patients 
where they tried to match them in terms of risk. And they compared a hospital outpatient to an independent office. And the, the outcome of that study or the results of that study was no significant differences in mortality, hospitalizations, or emergency visits between the two settings of care. So there's no question we can deliver real high quality care in an outpatient environment. Fantastic. Yeah. Um, what are the effects on the marketplace of these site of service differentials? So these differentials, when they came out back to 2000, this drove basically this arms race of practice in ASC acquisitions by hospitals. And so we've seen this massive change in how physicians work from being, you know, business owners in independent practices to now being employed. And we've crossed this threshold just recently where well over half of physicians are now in an employed model. And so what's happened with this is it's driven consolidation, vertical and horizontal integration, and it's reduced competition and increased cost without providing any value for that additional money. I see. Yeah, that's unfortunate. You've probably seen that in your local market, but have you heard that that's kind of been happening around the country as well? Yes. Yeah. I mean, we're down in the Twin Cities market to, I don't know, four or five sort of systems now. And largely the patient pool has already been divided up and such that there's almost no competition anymore. So it's not a good way of delivering value. Absolutely. Okay. What are some of the regular legislative events that are happening regarding site of service differentials? So there are efforts at the federal level to eliminate these site of service differentials. And Congress in 2021 has introduced a bipartisan site neutral payment where they're trying to equalize Medicare reimbursement across all sites of services, including emergency services and outpatient procedures. And so this is happening, but they're really under major criticism and lobbying from the hospital groups. And the hospital groups far outspend the other groups lobbying to have site of service neutral payments. Absolutely. Yeah. Because they, you know, they have the ability, whereas everyone else is kind of independent. So who's advocating on the independent side? So on the independent side, we would have, you know, our groups that are dedicated to outpatient medicine. So in our space, in the vascular world, that would primarily be OEIS. But our major medical groups are not really societies aren't weighing in on this because their membership doesn't necessarily all agree that site of service differentials are bad. So where do you see this going like in the next 10 years? Do you think that it's going to win out or do you think it's going to just be further consolidation? Well, it's pretty clear site of service differentials are bad because they bring a whole pile of perverse incentives and they don't allow us to drive towards providing cost-efficient, value-based care. And that's what we really need to do. We want to have competition in our marketplace and we don't want to create these artificial drivers for where procedures or patients are seen. And so we need to really look at reform. And that's where this legislation in front of Congress is at, is trying to do this. And obviously, these are really significant changes that would come in terms of reimbursement. And so they need to be addressed very carefully so that small, like rural hospitals, or critical access hospitals are not adversely affected by these changes. But we really want to have price transparency where we understand what we're paying for service and to actually have that done in the site that can most efficiently deliver that service. That's fantastic. That's a very well put together statement. What would be the ideal scenario? And then for just regular doctors like us, what can we do to help support this reform? Well, I guess be loud and vocal, talk to your reps. They're under tremendous pressure with far bigger dollars being directed at them than what the physician groups are able to do. But I think even at that level, Medicare and the government realizes the just sheer ridiculousness of paying 50% more for the exact same thing just because it happens to be in a different site. So I think these inequalities inside of service payments really have distorted the healthcare market and the healthcare market forces. And they've really unnecessarily inflated costs 
And so we really need to figure out a way of basically recalibrating how we pay for these services. And I think that's what really both groups, everybody should be focused on delivering high quality care for the least cost possible. And we need to find a way to move this forward so we can have a healthcare system we can afford. Yeah, (laughs) absolutely. What are all the negative consequences that come out of of site-of-service differentials? Well, there's a lot of different things that happen from these differentials. One of them is it creates these perverse incentives. So we have procedures being done in a site because of their reimbursement rate rather than the procedure being done in the appropriate site. So as we discussed, for instance, we may one day our office is is a physician office and the next day it's an ASC because the procedures reimburse differently. And so that's one example of these perverse incentives. The other is the hospital acquisition of patient practices where the same service gets reimbursed at a very high rate. And so, you know, we see these things where people like in the New York Times where someone goes, last year I got my colonoscopy and it was $800 and the next year or five years later I got it and it was $5,000. And that's because that GI group is now a hospital-based practice rather than an outpatient-based practice. So the other things it does is it obviously drives increased costs on that we have to pay. So ultimately, we talk about we have a multi-payer system. We really have a single-payer system, and the single payer is you and I. And we don't have a lot of control, yet we're getting driven into facilities that cost more. We're the ones paying for the site-of-service differentials filters down to the consumer, right? It all filters down to the consumer, right? And so again, they drive things like loss of competition. We have monopolization where these large healthcare systems are controlling the delivery of care in in their marketplace. Yeah. No, it's it's like there's a lot of factors in play that the average person doesn't realize um, go to get their their indicated procedures. Right. If an oncologist is sending you to a hospital to get a chest port or they could send it to the OBL down the street. There's no conversation with the patient going, hey, that chessboard's going to cost you $4,000 in the hospital, but $1,200 in the physician office. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I don't think it's uh, negligent from the referring provider. I, I think part of it is they don't really understand the financial dynamics as well. Yeah, I, there is some driving on the physician side in terms of their referral patterns. So employed physicians are heavily disincentivized to refer out of their hospital. And so a a hospital-based physician isn't going to refer a patient to your office-based lab just because you're less expensive. And so that's where we see this loss of competition in the marketplace. You can offer this patient something that would cost a lot less, and yet the employed physician isn't going to give you the choice. And again, this gets to this consolidation in the marketplace and the lack of competition. The employed physician is not incentivized to send you to the best physician in the market. They're incentivized to send you to another physician that's employed by the same hospital system as they are. Yeah, that's true. And then as you said, you know, over 50% of physicians are now in employed physicians. That's just going to increase as more and more health systems are consolidated. And a lot of the older independent practices kind of decide that the cost of keeping their practice up is going to be too high. So yeah, I I don't know, just looking at it from my perspective, it just looks, it looks kind of bleak, you know? Yeah, I, everything always, my entire career in medicine has been about everything always being bleak, like (laughs) from, from medical school through residence, internship, residency, fellowship, We've always heard everybody complaining all about the doom and gloom. And there's no question, you know, healthcare, there are a lot of challenges working in this field. And there's been a lot of bad things, uh, I think, that have happened to that physicians have allowed to happen to them over the last 20 years. But the flip side that I always tell people is there is just no job like being a physician. I don't think there's anything that compares to what we do, the value of what we do, 
I can't imagine a better career. Well, I think that's an awesome place to end it because got to have some positivity on a day like today. Absolutely. Yes. There are challenges. There are challenges. There will always be challenges in what we do and how we deliver healthcare. And the most important thing is for people understand how you're getting paid. I'm just amazed how physicians don't understand this. And to advocate for high quality value-based care, that should be our mantra. And that's where we need to go. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Dong, Michael Barraza, and Ali Behetti. Our audio team is led by Kieran Gannon with support from Josh McWhorter, Aaron Bowles, Nick Shellcross, Josh Spencer, design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz, social media and PR by Ann Dang, Manisha Naganathanahali, and Manbir Singh Sabli. Administrative support provided by Jim Lloyd Kinnebrew. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening. 